Welcome to the German Council on Foreign Relations, DGAP, and welcome to this week's edition of our Thursday morning briefings. My name is Jan Stockmann, and I'm head of the director's office here at DGAP, and it is my great pleasure to be chairing this morning's briefing. This series started in February 2022, uh, focusing on Russia's aggression on Ukraine. But today, this week, we will look at the defense industry and how it is adapting to new geopolitical realities. Having firmly committed to NATO's 2% target after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022, the German government is still struggling to spend additional funds effectively. This has repercussions not only for Ukraine, but also for the defense industry itself. Over the past days, several market observers have warned about the downside risk of European defense stock valuations, with Rheinmetall losing 6.6% on a single day. At the same time, attempts are being made at the European level to strengthen common military industrial complex. The European Commission first ever defense strategy put forward last month proposes a new program worth 1.5 billion euros. Its ambitious goals include that by 2030, at least 40% of the defense equipment be purchased by working together, and that at least half of national defense procurement budgets is spent on products made in Europe. Now, current developments point in a different direction. How can policymakers work towards a predictable and reliable framework for the defense industry? What does the German government in particular need to do in order to achieve its international security pledges? And what are the prospects for European cooperation? We are thrilled to welcome two excellent speakers today to discuss these questions and many more questions that you may raise in the Q&A to talk about the solutions to the disruptions facing the defense industry. Our first speaker, Dr. Christian Mölling, is head of the Center for Security and Defense here at the German Council on Foreign Relations, a leading expert on all things military and defense, uh, including especially uh, on budgetary questions in Germany. Christian is the co-author of a DJP memo that came out yesterday on industrial policy in the defense sector, um, and he will be delivering his remarks first. After, welcome Christian. After Christian, uh, we will hear from Susanne Wiegand, who is CEO of Rank Group since 2021, uh, a company, I might add, of some 3,400 employees headquartered in Augsburg, specializing in gearboxes and other systems for military vehicles in Alia. Before that, at Rheinmetall Defense and ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems, she's a leading industrial expert in the defense industry. We're glad to have you, Ms. Wiegand. Thank you. Now, before we begin, just a few housekeeping announcements. We would like to remind you that this event is being recorded and will be uploaded subsequently. We will kick off our conversation on the panel in just a few minutes uh, with about five to six minutes of intro remarks each. And then we will open up for questions um, after about 25 minutes. Today, um, since we only have two speakers, um, we will finish promptly at quarter past nine. We were intending to have a political voice on the panel as well and reached out to several MPs who unfortunately for time reasons couldn't make it, but I'm sure we will continue this conversation in a dialogue with uh, political voices as well in the future. In the Q&A, if you would like to ask a question, please uh, use the raise your hand function here in Zoom and when invited to speak, briefly introduce yourself and keep your question or comment relatively short so we can pick up as many as possible. Finally, just a word of thanks to my colleagues uh, helping in this event series, above all Milan Nitsch, Henning Hoff and Julia Reva, but everybody else in the events team um, at, at DGAP. Uh, so without much further ado, over to you, Christian. What's going wrong in German defense policy at the moment and what needs to change? <laughs> thanks, Jan, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks for, for joining us on, on this, um, yeah, indeed, very timely conversation, I think. Uh, many of the uh, parliamentarians currently are possibly hesitant to uh, to become vocal about it because they are all in the process of defining their position on how to work in the future with the defense industry and what the government basically should do. Um, and that is, um, if you kind of take a bird's eye perspective on that, I think that we are really in a phase of still the adaptation to disruption. Um, the first point about disruption is it really makes that many things are new to us. Um, and that of course starts with the um, kind of with the German perspectives. Um, that is in theory, or defense industrial 
you know, governance has been a theory for a long time, um, but it wasn't really there. Now, we have a big talk in Germany about we need to do defense industrial policy. There's a big question mark how to do it. And especially, um, as we haven't done that very actively, actually, the, the term was even kind of, you know, to, a taboo um, in, in the last decade. Um, we not only have to find a way of how do we do it, but also how do we do it in times of change? This is the, the very important point. And just to to give you some some kind of your heads up for what the the disruption basically means. It means on the one hand, um, of course, scaling up of, of national production, not because we want to support the industry, but the key function of the industry is to support the armed forces, uh, and especially in times when we are looking into the poten into a potential conflict. So this is what you call security of supply, which you need in peacetime and in wartime. And it's pretty clear that this is security of supply is currently not available. Um, and so this is basically the ramp up that we would need to talk about. And it is significant. Um, but also that means growth in, in, in many areas. Um, so that's a national perspective. Uh, on the European perspective, we basically also have to, to see that uh, the old assumptions of how the European defense industrial base works, how the European defense equipment work, uh, market could work, these are old theories which no longer work because there was the idea to say we basically have to consolidate the defense industrial base which means getting rid of company we now have the have the inverse problem we basically need more capacities so the old solutions that have been there that the european commission is still working with um, are no longer the right things problem is what are the right things we are not only we are think tanks but also the european commission others miss a clear picture of how the defense industrial landscape looks like today and how it should basically look like in the future. So it's really something where you, you're looking into a black box. At the same time, and that is, I think, one of the most important points here, um, this is not a, we can't remain in the classical talking points of it's German industry, it's European industry, what needs to change. We have a global change. Uh, that's not only because of the war, but the war, um, the Russian war, of course, uh, triggers a lot of developments. But it basically means we have to position uh, industry in a changing global environment. There's demand going up. Uh, on the one hand, there are new opportunities uh, for European industries, also for German industries. But there are also new risks that come with that. That is with regard to the supply chain. Um, also, new opportunities with regards to you possibly have more suppliers in the future, which German industries may feel as a risk. But as you're the German armed forces, you're, of course, happy to buy um, from somebody else if he or she can basically deliver quicker. Um, at the end of the day, if we come to the solutions to all these problems, um, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, after the kind of commonplace old solutions don't work for new environments, um, making defense industrial policy work, first of all, needs a clear picture of what the defense industrial ecosystem really is, on the one hand. Um, and second, where do you basically want to put your priorities? Because you can't have a fully-fledged German defense industry which supports uh, the German armed forces. And second, then, if you have your, your industrial objectives clear, uh, you basically need the resources. It's also kind of kind of a no-brainer that at the, at the end of the day, this industry that we have and that many other countries in Europe have is a private industry. So they work like a private company on the conditions of that. It's nothing where you uh, basically can order uh, the industry to do something without having the money ready for them. So that's a kind of a very simple thing, but at the same time, you see politically it's a larger it's a larger problem in here, especially for um, from the German point of view. A again, for the German, but that may also be true for the Europeans, we possibly need a new legal framework, um, which is enabling us ramping up production um, by scaling down regulations that currently hampering the ramping up of production. That is about, for example, transporting chemicals all through Europe. How do you basically get the license to get a new plant, uh, to, to build a new company, to, to build a new production site? All these things are there, plenty of thousands of regulations where you can think of whether they are still useful or whether we should basically throw them um, out, of, out of the window. And last point I'd like to make on the global scale, because I, I don't want to be 
uh, I don't want to see this missed in the current considerations that we are focused, that we are very uh, inward looking towards Europe. There is a, the need for going global with your strategic perspective, um, simply because yeah, there are also opportunities where the Russians are currently uh, bailing out of being suppliers to countries. It is an opportunity for German and European industries to become suppliers. And that's not only on the industrial side, that's also on the geostrategic side. Because we know from the past that having defense industrial ties to countries is a long-term established relationship because it's so sensible and basically equipment is so long enduring. And there, I'm happy to stop taking your questions after Sabine has been there. Thanks so much, Christian. Allow me just to ask a brief follow-up question before we hand over to Susanne Wiegand, uh, because in the memo, which uh, I hear will be uh, published in some form in English as well, but is currently only out in, in, in German, you refer to some uh, international comparative examples, amongst others uh, Finland and Norway, but you also mentioned the US Defense Production Act. If you could just highlight very briefly, uh, what, what are they doing better? Um, what, what should um, Germany look at? Yeah, so the Finns and the Norwegians are kind of different. They're doing things better in, in different ways. Then the Finns had um, never scaled down their capacity uh, to be ready to fight a war. Um, that's that's the, the simple reality. So they also had um, contracts and obligations from the state towards the industry to be ready to ramp up production. That's what they are already doing. What, what is helping them currently to produce ammunition immediately and helping the Ukrainians, but it's also, of course, a capacity that helps them. The Norwegians are ramping up their production capacity um, kind of from the cold, but with a significant investment in money. It's not a big industry, but it's something that at least happens. And time is of essence here. Yeah. The other paper that we have written last, last year, um, which made a big splash, was about the deadline that we have to get ready in defense. And this is something where we basically, that's another kind of a, a disruption. It's now about time and quantity. It's no longer about quality whenever it comes. So there are many things on that. And the US basically also is currently developing different models. Um, what they have is they have state-owned production sites um, where just the industry takes over to run the production, but they don't uh, have the costs for the for the infrastructure. So there are many models currently out there, and it's very good also from that for that reason to just take a look around and see what could be feasible for Germany as well. Um, also, always reminding there is change coming. The old Germany will not be able to ramp up the production that is needed for the new security times. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Look forward to coming back to that in the Q&A. But for now, I'd like to hand over to Susanne Wiegand and invite you to your opening remarks, especially from the perspective of the defense industry and what you expect from the German government. Please. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, uh, Christian, uh, for giving me the opportunity here to, to speak. I, I would make very briefly uh, some key points from the industrial perspective. So first of all, uh, we need to recognize that industry, even if we want to cannot just start production without order. So we need approvals from government for production, also for storage, uh, storage of, of, of weapons and arms goods. And this requires typically uh, that there are orders in place. Um, so uh, even if we want, we cannot just go and do something and, and, and pr produce something on stock uh, in the hope that we get an order somewhere. So this is uh, maybe a first point uh, which, which is important to understand and uh, I think needs to be recognized from uh, the regulations point of view. Uh, second thing is obviously to ramp up and scale up uh, industry and capacities is uh, requiring people. Um, uh, most of our people require security checks. Uh, this again requires uh, governmental procedures. They take months. So uh, we can hire people, but we are not allowed to put uh, uh, uncleared and, and not security check people to, uh, into various uh, works and jobs. Uh, so again, here, close collaboration and uh, reduction of bureaucracy, uh, building up capacities on the governmental side um, uh, is required uh, to support industry in the ramping up um, processes. Uh, generally, and I think this is more true for the small and mid-sized companies, um, bureaucracy needs to be reduced. Uh, there is 
uh, a huge number of further things uh, we require from even small companies, which they have to do, also not helpful in concentrating on increasing capacities. Um, Christian, you touched already the defense industrial policy and strategy, which is required. I think this is one of the biggest problems we have in Germany. We don't have an industrial policy for, for the industry. Uh, this was um, perceived as not needed in the last 20, 30 years. So we do not have appropriate clear picture. Where do we want to go? What do we really require from industry? Christian, you have mentioned that. Uh, I think Germany has started to define what are uh, national security relevant technologies and activities, but I think this is there's not a complete picture. There's not a clear description of the role of what we require from industry going forward in the future under uh, changed uh, our changed security environment. Um, uh, we need the definition of what we understand uh, uh, and require with respect to German sovereignty. Uh, so where do we really want to be independent, maybe even from European or NATO partners and do this on our own? We need close collaboration and interaction between industry, between governmental stakeholders. Um, this is partly established, uh, but not to the extent uh, needed and required um, for, uh, uh, for uh, let's say, in an in industry which is capable to cope uh, with the situation we have at the moment, and industrial policy also uh, need to cover the full full range of uh, what what Christian has has touched with the example in the U.S. that U.S. government is even owning production sites, taking care of infrastructure, um, uh, capital expenditure, and industry as the competent partner is is running and operating that down to. Uh, really R&D topics, uh, because uh, uh, we should also not, not forget uh, to think really mid to long term future technologies and not just fill the holes and the gaps which, which we are confronted with today of what is missing uh, in, in the, let's say, equipment and outfitting of our armed forces, but we really need to have a holistic view on, on things entirely. Um, with respect to procurement, and I think this is uh, one of the most crucial issues here in Germany, uh, we, we need to get rid of this um, small batches, project by project uh, uh, approach of procuring things, 18 pieces of something here, uh, a reduced second batch of something there. So industry requires uh, a mid to long term visibility on on orders, on capacity required. Uh, in our words, we need a business case to invest and to grow um, uh, our resources uh, from the infrastructure point of view, from the personnel point of view, from the supply chain point of view. And this requires that we have, uh, uh, that we get contracts uh, uh, for, for mid to long term, that we have visibility. And, uh, and uh, I think at the end of the day, this comes down to the question, uh, will Germany be able, willing and capable uh, to, to, to spend the money which is required to place mid to long term contracts, which uh, also means uh, in consequence uh, that we think big and not small and not in, in, in small pieces and components. And then once a project is delivered, we have an interruption of production for a few years or at least uncertainty uh, whether there is a continuation uh, or not. So these long lines of procurement, these stable supply chains between industry and, and, uh, and armed forces and government are required and we don't have that at all. And uh, this has also not been established in the last uh, two or three years since we have uh, war, war in Ukraine in, in full escalation. Mm -hmm. And um, and this brings me to the next point, which is uh, financing and uh, let's say uh, the financial uh, institutions, meaning meaning banks. Um, uh, we have heard, and this is still the case in Germany, uh, that uh, banks, according to their own rules, which they have given themselves, restricting themselves uh, from being uh, in, engaged in, in defense companies on, on, on the debt side as well as on the equity side. Um, uh, I personally uh, recognize that things are getting better, 
Um, so, uh, but but we are we are not in a situation or in a status as uh, as in other countries like uh, in, in in the U.S. or in the U.K. where you do not hear at all that there is um, uh, ESG ESG restrictions. So I think we need a full redefinition of of uh, uh, the understanding and and ESG criteria with respect to the defense industry. Um, uh, obviously. Uh, uh, I think we are all aware that um, uh, it, 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 it doesn't help uh, to, to invest in the next thousand kilometers of, of uh, uh, a pathway for, for bicycling or uh, the next kindergartens, which is all required if, if, uh, if peace and democracy and freedom are endangered or, or even actively attacked. So I think mm -hmm. the foundation and the fundament of any ESG discussion um, mu mu must be must be security and peace, and um, and this is not uh, reflected in the actual ESG and taxonomy definitions. So this is something mm -hmm. which uh, is urgently to be changed, um, and the financial institutions uh, are really behind. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is a, a mindset change uh, visible in various uh, with various stakeholders and sectors. But in that industry, they really have, and this is not by law, this is their own rules they have given themselves, um, uh, restricting themselves, and they hide back again uh, behind that. And this also uh, is, is, is not a pure German topic, but I can clearly say uh, when you meet investors and, and stakeholders from, from, from the sphere in, in, in London or New York, you're not confronted at all with ESG constraints or even critical questions, you find that uh, in the European space and, and particularly also still in Germany. And uh, again, uh, large corporations are capable to go to the global market uh, uh, to find uh, capital resources, small and medium sized com companies uh, are simply uh, don't simply have the setup to do so. So we are restricting ourselves unnecessarily and uh, uh, but in the in the very moment, uh, industry has business cases. I think the discussion with any um, stakeholder from financial industry is uh, at least a little bit more easy. If we don't even have the business case, meaning no orders, no visibility mid to long term from our customers, uh, there is no point whatsoever uh, to get to get financing, neither no. on the equity side and nor on the debt side. Excuse me, allow me allow me to stop you here so we can get into a conversation. Um, I'd like to ask a brief follow-up question, perhaps, uh, to allow you to finish your point uh, and then invite our audience to join in. Um, your, the problems you just outlined, granted. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we look at the numbers last year, the German defense industry exported a record uh, 12.2 billion euros. Um, so provocative question is is there a reason to complain the reputation of the defense industry as well has has seen changes in the in the in the last months um so 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 how would you re respond to that and perhaps let me also take up a question which we've received from our listeners in the in the registration uh, which is about the readiness for, for war uh, to pick up this this term kriegstüchtigkeit that was uh, thrown up in the german debate recently um, when is the German defense industry, if at all, um, ready ready for war? So a quick chance to react to that, uh, Ms. Wiegand, and then uh, we'll get to our audience in just a minute. Um, uh, maybe uh, first of all, with, re with respect to export, um, and, and basically, let allow me this comment. Uh, this is no time to complain, you know. We all need to stand together and find solutions because it's crucial now. So we are not, we are not complaining. We are just uh, exchanging facts here. Um, we are not complaining about export. Um, uh, the, the, the exports which have been approved and, uh, and done recently are predominantly for Ukraine. And this is good and okay. What we need also to scale up and to get market available products is generally uh, an opening uh, of, of export procedures, a little bit more pragmatism also in approval processes. I mean, timing now here. And I'm not saying specifically uh, we should deliver and allow exports in, into countries or regimes. Uh, we, we all do not want to be confronted with. Absolutely, this is not my point. Uh, but there are many so-called third-party countries, which is out of EU and out of NATO, uh, which are which are also from 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 a diplomatic and 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 uh, let's say 
uh, overall strategic perspective from government important countries uh, which we which we should deliver and we have not uh, let's say uh, we have not seen very pragmatic processes with those countries and just to mention a few uh, which are so called third party countries not eu not nato as we know south korea is also maybe india is singapore is australia so those are not uh, I think critical countries for export, and if we take India specifically, uh, we sh we should not uh, uh, we, we we should not let's say push them uh, into into the arms of of, of Russia and in even more in dependency on those guys, uh, but rather uh, uh, open up and understand that they make their way that this is uh, a democracy, even if uh, not to the values maybe we in Germany would love to see. Uh, but those countries uh, are on their way, and I think it would be would be stupid not to embrace them. And uh, with respect to industry and Kriegstüchtig, ready for war, um, I think industry has scaled up already. Um, uh, what, what what we what we could let's say do, and for what we are responsible for, without these um, mid to long term orders. Uh, so um, I think industry is today not war capable in all respects definitely not uh, so we need to scale up but it's not just finger pointing to to industry that after two years we, we are still not ready for that we require uh, 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 building up capacity and this requires honestly orders so we, we need those orders uh, we don't produce factories um, uh, uh, just in the hope uh, or in the expectation uh, that uh, somebody is someone placing orders and the ramp up, and this would be my last comment to this question, um, uh, which we have done is in, I can't speak for all industry, but for many I know, broadly spent uh, into export because others are faster than Bundeswehr. So the German government is definitely not fast in ordering. So the capacities we have are, are, are definitely uh, all used and, and don't sit idle somewhere. But we are delivering at the moment also to partners and friends, which is good. Uh, but we would love to and we need to re-equip Bundeswehr much faster. And if we see uh, that we have just received an order for 18 Leopard tanks, which is exactly the number we have deployed and donated to Ukraine uh, to refill that hole. This has nothing to do with re-equipping Bundeswehr and make Bundeswehr ready for war. So we need to think much bigger. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'd like to open up for Q&A um, and I will take your question in a second, uh, Mr. Wittmann. Uh, I also want to pick up a question from Johannes Hart uh, posted in the chat uh, about state ownership uh, as, as one of the ideas for, for success. Uh, and if you think that this would be something, uh, a path for Germany as well. Uh, this is Jonas Hart from the uh, Defense Attaché at the Swedish Embassy in Berlin. Now over to you, Gerhard Wittmann. Please introduce yourself and ask your question or comment to the panel. Well, my name is Gerhard Wittmann. I'm a member of DJIP. I used to work for Rank and happily I'm a shareholder of Rank again. I have two questions to Ms. Wiegand. First of all, for a couple of years, we have seen the development in Germany that there is a second producer for tanks. I'm talking about Rheinmetall. Rheinmetall has an own main battle tank with the Panther, and they have an exportable armor personnel carrier. I'm talking about the Lynx. At the private IPO of Rank, of Rank there was a very privileged position for Kraus Maffei Wegmann, giving them a package of shares. Is it a smart policy of Triton to place a to praise rank so much on the side of Kraus Maffei Wigman and not to have a more independent position between the two tank producers. And the second question is, rank has a very strong position in the field of naval propulsion systems. I talk about the traditional mechanical Kodok and Kodak systems. On the other hand, rank has also developed a very innovative system. I talk about the rank all the, the, the rank electric drive with first orders from the German Navy and the Finnish Navy. What is your expect, expectation for the future? Will electric mechanical system dominate the naval propulsion market or the more the traditional mechanical systems? Thank you. Okay, let's take these two questions. I'd like to start with Christian and then move to Ms. Wiegand. And then the next round, I see there are already questions, fiscal questions coming up in the chat, uh, but we'll save those for the next round. Over to you, Christian. Yeah, I guess there's not much for me to say. Interesting questions, uh, also with regards to possibly 
shareholders increasing their stocks uh, in rank or not, I'm not sure that's the, that's the place where we basically uh, give people or help people to, uh, to manage their portfolios possibly here. So possibly that's more a private conversation. So I would like to uh, drop out of that. Thanks. Shall I take over, Jan? Yes, please. Yeah. Over to you. So, uh, uh, Wittmann, thank you very much for your questions. Very good question. Thank you for trusting us and being a shareholder. Much appreciated. Um, a very brief and short answer on your second question with respect to naval expectation is obviously um, uh, that, that we continue and even increase uh, hybrid solutions, uh, meaning including electrical components. Uh, so, so we see demand in the market uh, increasing for for uh, uh, electrical and 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 combined um, uh, solutions and and configurations in the navy side, the let's say very old traditional world of of pure mechanical solutions uh, um, will further exist for sure on on, on smaller vessels, uh, OPV kind of kind of vessels. Uh, but in the more sophisticated uh, uh, surface combatant area, um, uh, we, we do not see too much, uh, even almost not at all, any more pure mechanical solutions. Hope this answers this question. Uh, with respect uh, to, to shareholding and, and K and the S, um, uh, honestly, um, uh, also very, very blunt and straightforward explanation, which you, I'm sure, will appreciate. First of all, uh, rank is agnostic to all the primes and vehicle manufacturers. Our largest uh, uh, integrator customer is, by the way, BAE Systems. Um, uh, we work with GD Land Systems. We obviously work with KNDS, so with the Nexter side as well as with the KMW side, and obviously also with Rheinmetall. They're all uh, dear customers. We treat them all the same, and there is no difference. And this is important uh, to be kept. Uh, because this is the fundament of our business model. So rank is fully independent uh, to any and all uh, those integrators and OEMs, and we treat them all the same. Um, and exactly this was the reason why KNDS uh, uh, took a package uh, of shares uh, in the initial IPO. Um, by the way, uh, we offered this also to others, but uh, KNDS uh, was specifically interested that we stay independent. And to stay independent was the way that the IPO, uh, so the, the going back to equity capital markets will fly and that we are not taken over by one integrator being instrumentalized and so to say be de dependent from one. So KNW and, and, and next uh, together KNDS exactly did that move to make sure that we have a successful IPO. And you might recall that our first attempt failed uh, last year in October. Uh, so this was a crucial point in time uh, that they took uh, a shareholding initially, um, uh, also as a signal to institutional investors mm -hmm. uh, to make the IPO reality. And with the IPO, we have a broad shareholder base and it's ensured and secured that rank is also in the future independent. And with mm -hmm. a shareholding of 6.7%, you have exactly nothing to say, not more, not less than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, obviously also no reaction whatsoever from any other integrator or concern with respect to a shareholding package of 6.7% uh, mm -hmm. of, of KNDS. So this was just the help to make the IPO fly that rank stays independent. Exactly this was the reason their strategy is not buying suppliers, not at Thank all. Thank you. I would like to pick up uh, two questions from the chat post by Max Garre, co-founder of the macroeconomics think tank uh, Dezernat Zukunft. He is asking, um, and these are two US related questions, he's asking about the government owned company operated model uh, that Christian that you mentioned uh, and the kinds of volumes um, um, that that are that are at play there, um, and then second question about uh, report in the Financial Times about um, large VC investments uh, in certain aspects of the defense tech industry, especially is is Europe missing something here? That's that's those are the two questions from Max Krahe, and I'd like to pick up another question in the audience by Guillaume Goma. If you could please introduce yourself and put your question or comment to the panel. Guillaume Gomar, we can't hear you yet. Yes, sorry, here I am. Can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, so, Guillaume Goma, I am the um, armament attaché by the French Embassy. Um, so, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Um, my question is about the, uh, let's call it the European business model overall. Um, uh, both uh, panelists um, regretted that we lack a, a vision on uh, the future landscape of the European defense industry. Uh, there seems to be two main paths here. One is, um, let's say, very much uh, liberal. Uh, let's, let's have competition play its role and um, the winner takes it all. Uh, and so we, we go to a sort of specialization of the uh, countries. So, for example, uh, Germany does land systems, France does air systems, and I don't know, Italy does uh, ships. Uh, the second model would be um, more uh, trans-European big groups like Airbus, KNDS, MBDA. And of course, uh, that cannot happen uh, spontaneously. So it, it requires some guidance from the states. And some, uh, so my question is, uh, from both uh, your points of view, what would be the best model between the two? And uh, what would be the, the way or the path uh, towards it? Thank you Thanks very much. A, thanks a lot for these questions. Again, I'd like to start with Christian and then move on to Ms. Wigand. Yeah, thanks. So I will take Guillaume's questions first and then go to the others. Um, I think there is an, there is an illusion uh, which many countries, not only um, France, but also Germany and others have, that is the ability to shape industry, um, be it state-owned or be it, uh, be it private, because at the end of the day, your industry goes where the money is. If you see that the French industry, as well as the German industry, get um, the overall um, in, in the overall volume more out of exports which me that means that the drive or the various drivers for company strategies are outside your country so even if it is government backed it is not your sovereign decision in all respects of where you go that means there is an industrial development or an industrial landscape on the one hand plus a political in Europe, plus a political landscape. And these two landscapes simply don't fit. So there are a lot of dreams about what Europe could achieve, blah, 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 which we had since um, since the end of the Cold War. And you can see that these, as you have said, that these um, kind of visions on how Europe, uh, how a European arms production should work, have never uh, coincided on the political side. And therefore, industry has gone global. Um, uh, some other factors coming into that as well. So I think it's it's not about only about you know having a shared vision on this, but also having the power to implement this. And this is simply uh, something where I coming back to what I said before, I think it's it's necessary to do a a stock taking, possibly even a joint stock taking, especially between Germany and France of where is this industry actually? Not where we want it to be, but where is it basically? Uh, and where do we want to shape it? Because, but the first question is, where is it and what drives it, basically? I think there are many misconceptions which are sometimes based in path dependencies of the political world. And on the other hand, um, don't take into account, as I said, the disruption that is currently taking place. And drawing the conclusions from the disruptions, I think in Paris and in Berlin, may look completely different. Um, and that is something where you know, there's a lot of work to do for our both countries, um, especially with regard to what is the role of the non-European players in the European market, but our role as industries also in the exp in the, the external market. And what is ex export not only in terms of um, finding the money to finance the industry, but also as a long-term strategic instrument to basically build a broader or a deeper production capacity um, even outside your countries and align other countries with yourself. Um, to the question of, of Max, um, first one is very simple. I don't know. I don't know the volume. Um, my, my impression is, but that is not verified at all, um, these investments are in 
very simple um, goods that are produced here, like ammunition, etc., or components. Um, for kind of those um, complex weapon systems, be it tanks, be it airplanes, you can't simply put, uh, especially not in the kind of in the mother state of capitalism. Uh, the state cannot put up a production plan for uh, for sixth generation fighter jets or something like that, and say we, we just produce it. Maybe I'm I'm not visionary enough, but I ca currently I can't I can't imagine that the that the Americans would do it. Also because time wise it's something that wouldn't work. Plus the production capacity in principle is there. That's not not the problem from from the American side. They have some niches where they um, or some some areas where they basically lack. Um, or they underproduce with regards to the demand that is there. Um, but I think these models cannot be a one-size-fits-all, basically. Plus, then a lot of you know industrial lobbying would come in because neither Lockheed Martin nor Boeing nor anybody else would like to lose its, its place or have more government um, uh, influence in, in, in the work uh, that comes. Um, on the second question on the venture capital, so VC, venture capital, um, yeah, I mean, the U.S. is traditionally much more uh, easygoing on these things. Plus, the volumes are always tremendous that they can put that they can put up for the domestic market. And then you have a kind of a spiraling effect that, you know, once you have something that works, uh, it's pretty good. You have the uh, the DARPA, the kind of the, the state-owned research agency, which is not doing project-related research um, on technology, but they just say, look, we just produce a, a resource, a pool of, in, of, of, um, um, of, of research and of technologies, and we just then get out of it what, what we need. So there's a different philosophy, especially, especially compared to Germany. It's not only the volume that they can throw into, uh, into it. There's also we, venture capital in Germany is something which traditionally we don't do. And also venture capital that is used for triggering civilian development and then bring it into the military side. That's something that we also have no tradition in. It's, um, we have the exact opposite. We have a long taboo between aligning for aligning civilian and military research and development. And we see all these things currently being discussed to be broken up. But even if you break the barriers, it will take us time to become acquainted to this new way of producing, new way of uh, developing technologies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and therefore, yeah, we may be uh, for a foreseeable time frame behind the curve, or we find very clever and creative ways of getting ahead of the curve again. Having said that, there are some areas in which Germany especially, especially also with regards to artificial intelligence, is still world leading. So there is, it's not reason to make us smaller than we are. Um, the question is, are we ready to go on a trajectory that is really up to speed and up to the relevance uh, of, of time that we are currently living in? Thanks, Christian, for your insights. Um, before I hand over to Ms. Wiegand, um, I'd like to throw in uh, two more questions from Heinrich Kreft and Tobias Müller, both of whom ask about cooperation on the European level um, and the potential uh, economies of scale and, and those effects that, that might be reached by European industry. Consolidation. I think we've heard a version of an answer to this question before, but uh, since we only have two minutes left, uh, I, I, would, I wanted to pick up as many questions as possible. And with that, I'm afraid we'll have to close questions because we'll uh, close at quarter past nine today. And so the last word goes, goes to you, Zanel Wigand, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very short. Uh, so obviously, um, being a representative of the industry, I'm not a fan of um, of not taking it private, but to to let's say uh, have too much gov government influence and owned. However, I think um, there there are good examples for public private partnership uh, constellations uh, for for specific cases. I think government now in the ramp up phase should support uh, capital expenditure, so financing building factories. Ultimately, I think uh, our system in Germany that the industry is private is not wrong. Um, uh, as one statement with respect to European collaboration, um, uh, I think it's the right way to go. Um, um, however, uh, we, need to, we need to keep uh, on a national level in each country for the sake of jobs, for the sake of sovereignty, 
for the sake of ultimate independence and 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 uh, uh, for the sake of ultimate independence of certain things and core technologies, we need to have uh, national setups and keep them. This will mean. Uh, even if we cooperate and collaborate, uh, that that we that we have some redundancies and not the full scale of of synergies, which uh, some want. I think this is not appropriate in that industry. That's why I think as a next possible step at all, whether this is the ultimate best solution, I I don't know and I would doubt. But as a next potential step. Um, constellations like we see that in MBDA or in, in KNDS, I think is, is a feasible way to go wherever it makes sense. I would not see that we dedicate uh, countries um, to, to, let's say, armed forces like Germany's land or Italy's navy or France's air or something. I would not see such setups. I think it's also not realistic and, and not target oriented. Uh, but but uh, uh, co coordinating things and 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 bundling strengths is required to scale up. Uh, but we we need to make sure that we have on national level uh, uh, certain capabilities uh, protected, uh, and that's why the discussion is, is is so difficult on that end. Thank you so much. I know there are more questions out there, and I'm sure we will come back to these questions in future iterations of our morning briefing series. But for today, I'm afraid we have to close uh, because we all have busy schedules uh, and need to move on. But let me thank once again, Susanne Wiegard and Christian Mölling uh, very much for sharing your insights with our audience today. And um, uh, this, this morning briefing will as always be available on YouTube afterwards. Uh, so stay loyal to the German Council on Foreign Relations um, and hopefully see you next week on this morning briefing series. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.